field trip. I'm sorry that we're not going to have the real field trip tomorrow, but uh, if you have any questions, then my email's there and delighted to talk. And well, I'm delighted to take one or two people along, but not, not a group of, of six or 10 at the moment. So here we are on Portobello Beach and uh, Joppa Rocks. So Portobello is a beach of two halves. Uh, to the west, it's all sand and covers up all the geology. And in fact, Portobello Beach was one of the first beaches in Britain to be covered in sand. They pumped it from offshore and covered up all the rocks, which is rather sad because the, the Pentland Fault, Fault comes out here uh, and uh, we don't see any of that. But to the east, there's a beautiful exposure of um, Carboniferous rocks, which we're going to talk about today. Um, a few, when was it? Let's just go to the next one. There's a nice uh, aerial view of the whole uh, Joppa section. Uh, and the building at the top on the right there is the pumping station. And that was built in about 1991. And before 1991, all of East Edinburgh's sewage went raw down a pipe just to the uh, west of there, out into the sea, and lots of material washed back onto the beach and the rocks. And the rocks were known for being dirty and full of rats, and nobody really went to look at the rocks until after 1991, when the pumping station opened and pumped all the sewage along to Seafield. And it's amazing how quickly the beach cleared uh, the rats disappeared, and uh, it's interesting when there was a public meeting to, to talk about building the pumping station, the, everybody thought everybody would be in favour of building it, but two old ladies who lived on the, in the row of houses that you can see opposite the rocks uh, stood up and said, no, we don't want this because of the rats. Where will the rats go? They'll go across the road and into our houses. So. Uh, the, the council officials were looked in stunned silence that anyone should think this. But anyway, the rats have disappeared. It's cleaned up. Portobello Beach is full of wild swimmers and occasional COVID crowds, but uh, everything's going well. So uh, the green area in the middle, uh, uh, so let's just talk about getting here. If you want to come, it's easy to come. As you can see on this picture, there's loads of parking on street. This picture was taken about 20 years ago, so it's got a bit a bit busier. Uh, the only things that have changed, a couple more houses have been built. And on the green patch in the middle, there is a, a poster uh, display board of the geology of, of Joppa that we did, I think, 15 to 20 years ago. The building in white is the oldest building in Portobello, and that was part of a big salt works. And uh, Joppa was notorious for making salt. They would burn uh, heat up the seawater using the coal in, in the Carboniferous section that we're going to, to look at in a few minutes. And, uh, and there's a, a long history of using coal from here, and we'll talk a bit more about that before. But when you come, we, it's normal to start at the bottom of the section and work up into younger rocks as we go to the west. But I, I suggest if you do come by yourselves, park down here at Eastfield and walk along the top and look at the rocks before you go down at this end uh, where you can get onto the beach and then walk along going up section. And at the end, you can get up a set of stairs here. It's, uh, it's about, I don't know, 800, 600 to 800 meters. It's uh, not too long a section. It's a bit scrabbly in places, uh, but good boots, you should be okay. But do be careful when you come out this bit, you can see it's green there. That's notoriously slippy at the bottom before you get onto the steps. That's what that green area looked like in the 1940s, 1950s. The last salt was produced in, I think, 1953. All that was demolished and all that remained was the wall, which you can see around here. And that was badly damaged in I think it was 2011 by a storm and the archaeologists took a, a chance to uh, excavate part of it and look at the old workings and underneath the old cottage which the older buildings left you can get into 
um, some of the old furnaces that cooked the, uh, the seawater. That's the, uh, it's worse, a bit worse for wear now. We've replaced it a couple of times, but it's, you can still see from, from the grass area what's going on. The other thing in this area besides the salt is of course the coal. And on this old, old map, you can see the, the main coal seams and they go all the way along. Of course, these ones are all hidden from um, by the, the sand being put on. But I just want to highlight this feature here, which is called the Great Gillespie Level. And that's a tunnel that was built from Joppa here all the way inland to Edmondson House. This is going along the Wisp and coming to Dalkeith Road. And that was built at sea level so that they could drain the pits uh, further south out to sea. And that was all well and good until everybody stopped mining um, some, I don't know, 10 to 15 years ago now. And they turned the pumps off. And the poor people that lived along here suddenly uh, were having their cellars full of orange yucky water that was flowing out everywhere. Now, the poor old coal authority worked for quite a way to, to try and solve that. And luckily now everything seems to be under control. The amount of coal that was worked along here and inland um, it was a thriving industry for a long time. And th the sad thing is that the coal is worked, so it's very difficult to see coal on, on the surface now. What you can do, you can look at the Joppa Shore leaflet that we did 15 years ago. And there is a guide, an excursion guide in the Edinburgh Geology book that was published a long time ago. Uh, and because of the, the change of sewage and rats in the newest uh, addition to Edinburgh outcrops uh, there is no mention of Joppa but hopefully now that things have cleaned up we can get it in in the next edition. Uh, if you do go just remember take care and it is tidal and if you go at high tide you won't see any rocks other than these basalt dolerite lumps that have been put there to protect the sea wall. So do please check the tides. You can do that online. Uh, and if they're good one week for the morning, they'll be bad the next week for the morning, but uh, do check. So let's, let's have a look at, at, the, at the rocks. Uh, we're going to see part of the upper limestone formation. It's the lowest part of the Numurian through the passage formation, which is mainly sandstones, sort of Numurian and into the lower coal measures, which is the latest Numurian. Uh, it's pretty continuous exposure. There are a few gaps where sand's filled in. And as you can see, the dip is pretty easy to spot or the strike out here towards the north. And we're dipping to the, to the east. So we, we're gradually getting younger from, from the stock. So we'll we'll have a few slides of each. I'll just put it into suggest for those of you that uh, sorry, there's a few faults. I'll just mark on on red approximate positions. Nothing very great. But just for those of you that are not in Edinburgh, put in a bit of context. There's Joppa in the middle. We're in the middle of the Midland Valley. Uh, the Pentland Fault is probably the biggest fault in in the in the district, which separates Arthur's Seat and the Pentland Hills from this big syncline known as the Midlothian syncline to the east. And in the middle of that is the coal measures. And we're just on the edge of that here. And you can see that there's a similar syncline on the other side of the fourth. And then there's another big syncline here, the Clackmannan syncline. And all the rocks on this side of Edinburgh are older than the rocks on this side. And to put it in context, there's Sicker Point outside the Southern Uplands Fault and the Highland Boundary Fault there. This is part of the uh, BGS map, and there's the coast here. And we're starting here in the upper limestone formation. We're going through the yellow rocks of the passage formation and just into the lower part of the coal measures. I always think it's amazing that they put all these limestones in the upper limestone formation when really there are very few limestones in there and they're very thin and nearly all of it is is shales or sandstones 
but it's different from the passage formation which has no limestones at all and there's this lovely Pentland fault the biggest biggest fault in in Edinburgh and it comes all the way through Portobello and there's not a sign of it at all and in cross section that's what it looks like this comes down about a kilometer and uh, there's a reverse fault the Pentland fault and it's all dipping to the east uh, I just thought I'd show you this this is a seismic section through the Midlothian syncline as you go north offshore uh, the section that we're looking at is in this bit here this is the top of the base of the coal measures and I think if you can see all these rocks here the sequence thins as you come to the to the side of the syncline suggesting that this syncline was growing during deposition it was then everything was eroded off the top sometime after the coal measures and, and we think this could well have been fairly soon maybe in the permian maybe uh, later but I, I i don't know how much is missing here but it could well be there's about 1500 meters of sediments that have been eroded off just on the basis of the sonic velocity uh, that you see in the sediments at the surface and there is there isn't a well oh, I could just go back sorry there is a well that was one well that was drilled for exploration for hydrocarbons in the middle of the fourth the first of fourth number one well was drilled by Conoco and it goes through this rather high to the to the side of the syncline and it didn't find anything and these rocks are all older than you see this rock six here this is is down below what we're looking at uh, and it found found uh, nothing to have it but there is one well uh, in Fife the interferritin one borehole if you if you can find anything about that the only I, I only flag this because it drilled exactly what we're going to see on the other side. So the lower coal measures at the top, the passage formation in the middle, and the, the upper limestone formation at the bottom. And again, this is one of the thin limestones, the Calmy limestone, which we'll see in a minute. This is the Castle Carey limestone, which is the youngest limestone in the group. And these little thin limestones that you can see in Joppa, you can see in Fife, and you can see in the Clackman and Syncline, and they extend over a huge area whereas in between we've got lots and lots of uh, non-marine sandstones a few thin marine bands but mostly this is a non-marine section and this is the section we're going to see this is taken from uh, some work by peach uh, in 1910 and he, he it's, it's quite a good one we, we will start at about here near this near this coal and the Calmy limestone and we'll walk all the way up to about here somewhere and he has four categories of sediment on here sandstones which you all know we can talk about those there's some really thick ones as you can see here and in the passage formation really thick sandstones lots of thin ones in this lower part and in the in the coal measures at the top and things he calls fire clays and marls those are like shales but there's no bedding in them they've all been reworked they've been leached out they're very pale compared with the darker shales which are quite rare and they're known as fire clays i think because you can make it they're um sea turfs really but because they've been leached you can use them for making fire fire bricks and then the other thing you mentioned is limestones and that's one and that's two there aren't any others there are several marine bands that are marked on by these lines here those marine bands are usually in shales with um iron oxide iron sideritic nodules that apparently hold um, fossils that that have managed they managed to date them and, and correlate with we're not supposed to hammer in this area now it's a special area with a regional regionally important geological site so it's pretty difficult to find fossils other than in the Castle Carey limestone and the Calmy limestone. But the marine bands, you can see by looking at these nodular, uh, sideritic nodules in, in the shales. So we'll start at the bottom and we start 
uh, I've got a little map here to show you on the section. This is starting, this, these old buildings have, have long since gone, and, but it's broadly where the pumping station is now. So the diamond will show you approximately where we are. And this is one of these faults that trends across the, uh, the beach. And you can see sandstone here, here against, uh, this is the classic sea, um, fire clay. See, it's gray, you can't see any bedding in it. And it's overlain by a dark, more carbonaceous clay. And you can see they've curved around as, as there's been movement on this fault. And those are typical rocks of the lower limestone formation. Right up against the pumping station, there's a, there's a sort of typical set of sequences. You go from a sandstone into a, a gray, well laminated shale up into a light, very light gray pale shale, which has lost its bedding and it's, it's probably soil processes and leaching. And quite often there's a sandstone at the top, which, which is also uh, more of a sea turf and you can't see the sedimentary structures. And sometimes at the top, there is a coal. Sometimes there's a coal in there, but often it's just this straight back into carbonaceous shale. But that's the, one of the typical sequences that you see in the, the I'll call it the lower, it's the upper limestone formation. Sorry, I've got that wrong. And round the corner, this is part of the old building. If you go round the corner from the pumping station, you see an outcrop in here of one of the limestones. And this is the lowest one that we see here, the Calmy limestone. I've done, I've done it on every one, sorry. It's the upper limestone formation. The limestones are hemocritic, sort of waxstone, some big uh, brachiopods and, and bivalves. There's little bits of crinoid. It's, a, it's certainly a marine limestone. Looking at the contacts, it's quite hard because of all this sand over the top. But as a, a relatively thin limestone that you can follow for miles and miles and miles, it's probably some eustatic event that has, has caused, caused this. And just above it, we can go into a sequence typical of, of the upper limestone group. And it starts at the bottom with these fine mudstones. These are sideritic layers in the middle. And you can see there's very little sand in it. And gradually you're getting a bit more sand as you go up. And then continuing up the sequence, you get more nicely developed ripples and it coarsens up into um, a sand on the top. And if you look, we were, we were just down here somewhere. You can see a series of these with a series of sandstones with shales. And this one seems to coarsen up into a sandstone. Then there's a sharp base as you go into a what's the fluvial sandstone. And then it finds up again into shales. Here's another one that has shales underneath, still dark shales at the bottom with some thin, thicker sandstones near the bottom. Then you get an erosive base and it finds up and finds up and back into shales. And here's, here's a an older one that comes down and you can follow these all the way across. This, this pipe is from the pumping station and it gets used if it's very heavy rain and there's a lot of runoff. And you can see just down here, this was one of the, the sea turf uh, fire clays. So that's typical of the upper limestone formation. There's one of the sea turfs, you get a really good stop with an erosive base uh, with a sandstone, you can see cross bedded and channeled inside it. And in this one, you can sometimes get a bit of coal preserved underneath. And that's a typical close up of these fire clays. You can see little black lines, probably roots. That are, that are left over, but no bedding structure whatsoever in it. Occasionally you get a hard band in the middle of these and you can divide it into sort of two, two events really. And then on top of that, there are some thicker sandstones that you get in the, <laughs> in the upper limestone formations. <laughs> and you can see here, th these ones the channeled at the base and there's the erosive base on the bottom and then big thick sandstones, that's unusual, but that's getting to the top. Uh, but then at the top of that sandstone, again, it, it finds up and back into shales and you can see there's some nodules and things here. Here's a, here's a close up 
you get uh, these nodules and one wonders whether there are marine this is one of the marine bands i haven't cheated and knocked into any of these to see if there's anything inside them but uh, that's the kind of thing that you see through the sequence that relates to marine incursions and at the top of the sequences you reach the second limestone this is a bit thicker there's some other little bits either side that aren't well exposed uh, you can sell it's gray and you can see this calcite that forms on this bit as you go further away from the shoreline sorry from the landward side of the beach uh, everything gets covered in barnacles and it's really difficult to see the the close-up so if you do walk along generally stay near the as near the road as you can at the bottom and you'll you'll see uh, clean washed surfaces this is very similar to the Kalmi limestone. I've seen on one occasion, I convinced myself I got a solitary coral, but there are certainly crinoids and, and brachiopods in there. And someone's been along at some point and taken a series of calls. I don't know who that was. And once you get that, oh, yes. Here's the limestone coming through here. And then there's a, a very thin, set of uh, shales and then you come into the passage the, the, sorry the well the castle carry is taken as the base of the passage formation but there are some shales and that has apparently some um, non-marine fossils in there thing and uh, so you've gone from the limestone it hasn't sort of nice shallowing upward sequence that cautions up but you've again sea levels change pretty rapidly and you've gone into non-marine shales and then the base of this thick sequence of fluvial sandstones of the passage formation, which is broadly equivalent to the millstone grit in England. And here you can see big, big channels and cutouts. And again, quite often the sands fine upwards as you go up to the top. And in the middle of the passage formation, there are some conglomerates or sort of very pebbly sands with subangular and angular quartz crystals. Uh, and there's some rejuvenation in the middle of the passage formation at some time. And I think that probably links to uh, changes in tectonics in the Midland Valley, where they think it's swapped from, I can't remember which way around it is, uh, left lateral to right lateral trans, trans pressure, trans tensions. And as you keep going through the, um, sequence you'll see that this is a big mass that you can walk on this is all one big channel complex but just have a look at this section here there's there's a fault coming through here on this side which you can't really see they're all boulders they've been laid as though it was man-made i'm sure it is and one wonders whether this sort of 10 meters by seven meter thing was a, a man-made feature that was used partly possibly to hold water from for the salt workings, but it's quite a complicated shape. And as you walk across, there's quite a big fault here. And these sandstones are, are over here on, on this side. And then there's some shales underneath here. But when you go and have a look at this fault, it's um, quite interesting. It comes through here and you can see the bedding is all going this way. And there's a sandstone at right angles along the fault. So this is possibly, a, well, I would think it's a sandstone dike along the fault that's been injected in as, as it moves. And then the, the fault comes through here somewhere. And there you can see it. It's quite good when you've got the tide coming in because you can see the strike very easily. And this is at right angles and the fault the fault's going through this way. So it's well worth stepping out down <coughs> onto that big area of rock just to look at that and see the relationship to the fault which you, which is quite is quite well exposed and these are these big sandstones that we, we, we saw a bit further back and there are other little faults on the beach this one you can see it moves uh, it hasn't moved that much <coughs> excuse me but you can this is typical of what you see between the sandstones you either get sand or just to the right, you get shales with thin sandstones in it. One suspects that there was probably coal in this one. The thin coals that were mined, whereas this one 
is, is um, soil horizons or fire clays. And we can look closely at the next one of those. You see a double, really quite a thick one. And they've gone red and mottled. And this one is more gray with some red mottling sandstone in it. And then another area that there's probably some coal in there that people have taken out. And then another sandstone, and possibly another little coal there. <coughs> these, these coals are all very thin on, on the logs, and it's primarily dark grey shales. There are one or two marine bands, but primarily it's stuff like this that is uh, associated with soils and you're close to sea level. And just further beyond, you come to a very unusual bed, this one here, and it's a close-up. These are nice black, dark grey shales, and the sand has pillowed down in, into this. In, in, the, in the leaflet that we've done, I say, well, maybe this is evidence for uh, seismic activity and, and faulting, but whatever it is, for some reason, this is soft sediment deformation and it's subsided and it's just in the one layer that's another example of it further along well worth trying to find that it's pretty it's pretty clear as you walk along just by the, the edge so you won't miss it it's a bit it's, it's you get you get some evidence of soft sediment deformation in the thick sandstones but this is the only thinner bed i presume it's a flash flood type um, floodplain sandstone for crevasse play and the underlying sediment was just the right consistency to uh, allow that to happen. The passage formation has huge cross beds in it and big channels. Here's one of these uh, soil horizons with a big channel coming through and there's another one. And then at the top you get thinner beds and then the next sandstone forms. And here's Rock Cottage, the oldest cottage. So you can use use the slides to sort of work out where you are when you haven't got the map. And just behind this, this is the in on the rocks. Uh, there's the largest cross beds. And like all the cross beds that I've tried to measure and things, they tend to come from towards the north, the current going to the south. And the paleogeography seems to be that these these rivers were flowing roughly north to south. And that's the biggest cross set sequence. It's about um, 18 inches to, to uh, two thirds of a meter across. And uh, most, of, most of the others are more channeled and smaller sets, but this is the biggest one. And you can't miss it as you're walking along uh, at the top there. Uh, and at, right at the the end of the the pub on the top, the in on the the, the last sandstone stops about here, and this is somewhere we can't see the coals, but there's a seven foot coal probably in here, which marks the base of the coal measures, and all these would have been worked along here, and there is a, 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 a quite a change, uh, no more very few big channels in these sandstones, they're very continuous, and there's a lot more shale in between as we move into the coal sequence. And if you're lucky, you'll see a little outcrop of coal. I try, I've try, I tried to find this recently and it's all covered in sand. I can't find it. And, and quite a few of the sands, I've got little ripples and uh, mud drapes on the top. And the main current is again from the north. It's not as though anything's really changed dramatically. But uh, certainly the the power of the rivers is reduced and you're more on the floodplain rather than in the big channels. And this is a typical view of what the coal measures look like. You can follow most of these rocks all the way along. There's a little fault there and you can follow all, this, all the sequences, all, all, the, all the beds right across. In some cases, you can see here, it's thickening up. Uh, some little maybe channeled sands and I think it doesn't show up very well. So I'm going to go back. You, no, sorry, my, my photographs are not that good, but there is one here that you can see it cutting down as well. So there are slight channels. Interesting, you can't see any coals, but 
along here, and you'll find this as you walk along, you will see a spring on water, nice clean water flowing out to sea. And um, if you look carefully, you'll see that the spring is really a bit to the nearer the shore, but this is wooden frames and uh, leftovers of, of a coal working where they've dug a, dug a, a um, what do you call it? A vertical, a vertical hole that you can walk down, that you can climb down and mine the coal underneath. A shaft, sorry. And the shaft's now filled with sand, but water is bubbling out through it. And if you go follow the water downstream, you'll see the remnants where they've cut through the sandstones. These are rails, the wooden ones that are just left. So they were wheeling barrel um, carts of coal down towards the sea at some point. A uh, fascinating bit of archaeology as it cuts through the, the sandstones. Well, that was pretty much a, a whistle-stop tour through it. Um, that usually takes me uh, two hours or so to walk through with everybody. That's the end of the section. And if it, this bit up here is mainly boulders, and if you're lucky and it's still very low tide, you can walk all the way around to Musselburgh. There's the um, Brunstein Burn Delta that comes out here. Do take your wellies if you're going to do that. <coughs> but uh, the section just sort of peters out as you get to the steps where you can get back up. So thank you for listening to that. Um, it's uh, my first go at doing one of these. I hope you enjoyed it. I just say that although we couldn't do it this year, this trip was going to be part of the Geological Association's annual conference meeting, which was going to be held in Edinburgh this weekend. Uh, we cancelled it quite a long time ago, but we've postponed it till this time next year. And hopefully, if I don't do one before, I can I can walk along the the uh, trip with you uh, sometime next year. Well, thank you all very much, and I'm going to try and stop sharing and see if, if anyone wants to ask questions. Please feel free to, uh, to do so. You can unmute yourselves.